Welcome to the Best of MBS podcast, a collection of the best interviews hosted by Michael Bungay Stanier, best selling author of The Coaching Habit and How to Begin. Today's interview is from the Find Your Great Work interview series. Here's your host, MBS. I'm totally excited to be talking today to Pam Slim, who is the best selling author of a terrific book called Escape from Cubicle Nation. From Corporate Prisoner to Thriving Entrepreneur. Now, how good is that as a title? You know, every now and then I come across books where I just go, oh, I wish I'd thought of that title. I wish I'd written a damn book. Um, and to add insult to injury, the book is really excellent. It is a fantastic book to help people, to help frustrated employees break out of a dispiriting corporate experience, which is far too common far too often. Now, if I, I would say that my, my focus in, in great work is actually going, how do you get great work to flourish within organizations? How do you find the right structures to make that happen? But part of what PAM stands for is, for some people and for many organizations, it's never going to happen. And I need to help these people escape and find a better life and a better way of doing things. Now, PAM's got, uh, PAM's seen the corporate world from both sides. She was a training, mar- a training manager in Barclays Global Investments in San Francisco for a number of years, then moved to become a consultant. Um, in fact, she had a great corporate name. It was Ganas, which is uh, a Spanish word for this intense desire to do something that matters, which is a, an awesomely good consulting name. And she worked as a trainer and a consultant looking into corporations and, and helping them try and do things differently. And It seems that there's this tipping moment when Pam, as a blogger, wrote this impassioned post called Open Letter to CXOs Across the Corporate World, where she finally laid it on the line and said, you know what, enough with this. I'm going to start helping your people escape because your corporate environment basically sucks. I'm not going to take prisoners, but I'm going to let the people who want to escape escape. And that's what she's been doing ever since. Uh, Guy Kawasaki picked up the blog, Guy, who's been one of the great work interviewees before, picked up the blog and promoted it, and Pam had sort of found her message for the world. And the book's been out, I guess, three or four months, and has been a, it's been not only a hit on its launch, but I suspect it's going to be a, 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 a slow burn winner for a number of years. So you can tell I'm excited to be talking to Pam. Pam, welcome to the call. Thank you for having me. How did I do that introduction? And I always get it slightly wrong. So <laughs> what would you want to add to that to... To, to have people get a better sense of who you are and where you come from. That was perfect. I think that was great. And I love that you were just, you know, insulted and, and mad about that book title. You know, I, I wish I could take credit for it. It felt like it just uh, knocked me in the head when I was walking my baby son around my, or my my kitchen. And so I'd like to say I spent, you know, hours and hours uh, writing out words and came out with Escape from Cubicle Nation. But maybe it was a bit of divine inspiration. <laughs> so it hit me instead of maybe swinging by your part of town and hitting you. <laughs> there's, something, there's something true about that. I know with all the stuff that I've ever created, it's... Uh, stuff has just sort of formed, almost arrived fully formed. I mean, when I wrote my first book, I uh, I woke up on uh, January the 1st, 2000, turned on my computer to see whether Y2K had crashed, and this idea for a book arrived almost 80% ready. And it was like, wow, that's pretty awesome. Write this down, people, so I don't forget it. So I, I get what you mean by arriving out of the blue. Um, yes. Yeah. You know, the work you're doing is so important. I saw Jack Welsh talking recently, and he, at at the Shroom Conference in 2009, the big HR conference, and his message to the HR people was, the biggest trend that I see as I go around this country is employees wanting to leave and and start their own business because they're tired of corporate life. So you're really um, tapped into the zeitgeist, I think, here around this moment of, of... a flourishing of entrepreneurial spirit probably started with Dan Pink and his free nation, free agent nation some years ago, but really coming into blue now. Maybe we can start this interview with you telling a great work story of your own, and, and then we can carry on with the interview and see where it takes us from there. Sure. Well, I as I think about the work that I've done in the last five years with Escape from Cubicle Nation and in both blogging and also working with clients, there's been a, a recent series of events and series of blog posts that to me are just really sum up everything that for me personally feels beautiful about this work. <laughs> and it's 
it all started when I got an email from a young man who at first was uh, anonymous who sent me a message saying, I'm 23 years old and I'm sitting here in my cubicle at a large financial services company and I'm completely miserable and underperforming and really not living up to my potential. I've always been a good student. I've always been very motivated and I just feel absolutely bored and not interested. And he said, I have the opportunity to go play baseball in Germany. Oh, this is a fantastic because, story because I've been, I've been following <laughs> this on your blog, so I sort of know where you're going with it, but please carry on. <laughs> so, so he said, you know, I'd love to go quit my job and play baseball in Germany, but my parents are, think it's, are really opposed to the idea. They think it's a terrible idea, and they think that I'm crazy to quit my job in this economy. And uh, could you help me out? Could you offer some advice? And you said, and, listen to your parents and do your time in the cubicle. Exactly. And that was the end of the story. No, no, I had me escape from cubicle nation lady. That wasn't exactly how it happened. Well, what I, what I heard, it was one of those, one of those moments, cause I actually get many, many, many of those emails, not surprisingly from people who are feeling miserable. And of course I can never respond to all of them via email. Cause that's all I would probably do. Right. So I, it, but it, there was something about this one that I thought, you know, this could be really interesting to see what my community would say about it, my blog readers and the larger community that I have. And so I think this was about back in January. And so I, I emailed back and I said, would you mind if, if you were allowed to remain anonymous, if I could just put this out to my community? And he said, great, that sounds wonderful. So I wrote an initial post including including verbatim what his original email was. And it was amazing. I got something like 65 or 70 comments, not surprisingly, from my community, <laughs> most of them from people that were about his parents' age, saying, absolutely, positively, take this opportunity. Don't feel boxed in. You have plenty of time. You know, where you have this opportunity to do something that's deeply important to you, by all means, do it. And there were amazing heartfelt stories of people who had not followed their passions earlier in their 20s, who were now in their 40s, who uh, had really lived to regret it. And so it was this amazing, amazing dialogue. So uh, this went on for a couple days. And then I got a message from John's mom. And he had shared the blog post initially with her, and she was just completely blown away by the response from the community. She just said, this is incredible. I can't believe it. I've really opened my mind, and, you know, it was amazing, you know, having this conversation with John. Maybe I should really, you know, think about it some more. So I, I then asked her, I said, is it okay if I share some of your impressions with my blog reader? So I did another post to that. And it, the story just kind of kept going where actually she ended up sharing it with John's dad, who was extremely opposed to the idea, was very conservative, you know, fiscally really thought it was a bad idea. And after reading the both posts and all the responses from the community, uh, John told me he actually started to cry, which was really, really unusual. So, so it, it, it was this amazing, you know, experience, which was just good enough for me to have that dialogue and that exchange, you know, with, um, with my community. And so it, it was maybe fairly recently I checked up and I sent John a message because I hadn't heard from him and I didn't know what he did. And so I said, you know, I'd love to do an update post and see, see what's going on with you. So he emailed back and he was indeed in Germany. He quit his job to play, to play a professional baseball. And he did this a wonderful update with all these photos of him in uniform playing. And he just said it was everything surpasses expectations. The amazing thing was that his parents came to visit him and his mom was originally born in Germany and she had not been back since she she was a very, very small child, and actually her mom was gravely ill at the time they made that trip. Yeah. And she said for her it was really a spiritual journey, and she said it was also amazing to watch John in his really matured uh, fashion. She said it was like it, I, it was a whole, seeing a whole different side of my son, and he was the one that led her all around to show her the country, and he was so confident and inspired. And so she ended up writing me a message about what that experience was for her. And she ended up saying, you know, through this whole experience of watching what has happened, I think we should have life coaches in high schools <laughs> to help kids, you know, make career decisions because I'm now seeing that the way we're doing it now is really broken. Yeah. And, and so there were 
were so many elements of this to me that were so powerful. One, just watching and walking through this experience with John and his family and seeing how by him making a choice about what was deeply important to him, it changed the entire dynamic of his relationship with his parents. And I I think because of his age, being just 23, it's really going to change the whole course of his life. But it also really changed and inspired a lot of my larger blog community. And I got messages from young people, from older people that really were touched by the story. And to me, the, the, thing, the elements about it that really make it great work is that it wasn't just me working as a coach with him. I wasn't a coach to him. Yeah. I just used the forum of my blog and my wonderful community to um, just <laughs> have a place in which people could have that dialogue and then amazing things happen. So that's one of my, one of my most favorite experiences. And, and I, I just feel so proud of having the forum in order for that kind of experience to, to happen. It's really wonderful. That's fantastic. It's a great story. And it's, you know, if anybody listening, it's really worth checking out back on Pam's blog just to track that story because it is a, it's a very moving and a very powerful story. So here's the thing, Pam. There are a lot of people still stuck in Cubicle Nation, um, hungry to take that leap and unable to, to make the leap. And you talk about to escape, you need two things. I think you need passion, something that you care about, and a business plan to um, a business plan to turn it into money so that you can survive. Well, where do you start? How can you? If, if I'm if I'm listening to this talk and I'm like, you've described my life. I need to escape this gray cubicle. Where would I even begin? Well, I think there there starting place for most people is in unrooting and uncovering what is it that you really care deeply about. It's one of the things I have learned from many successful entrepreneurs, including Guy Kawasaki, who, you know, I've talked to you about this issue and I know you've interviewed. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I was rereading, he just wrote um, about evangelism is is what evangelism is, is actually uh, bringing the good news about something. And it's really impossible to evangelize a, a really crappy idea. <laughs> so as you think about having the success of uh, a business that, that you want to put forward, it's really important that it's deeply important to you, that you feel a very strong connection with the depth of your soul and, and your interests, and that it's something that just really is very interesting to you, that you inherently uh, want to learn more about. And this it seems like it should be a simple thing, but in my 10 years crisscrossing the country in the U.S., working inside large corporations, I found it's actually not that easy. Many corporate employees have been in a situation for so many years where they are just getting by and basically turning off their emotions in order to make it through the day and make it through excruciating day-long PowerPoint presentation fests and all those things we know yeah, yeah. well inside corporations, that it actually does create a disconnect between um, people knowing what, what they're really passionate about. They, they can think about it and they, they try to do it from a thought process of, you know, what, well, what, what makes sense or what experience do I have and how can I turn that into a business idea? And in fact, the first step is often just really reconnecting with your creative self and doing things like uh, taking some time just to rest and relax and in, in being engaged in really creative activities. Uh, I was just in a workshop that I taught in Charlotte last week and they have a wonderful artist in resident uh, program at the McCall Center for the Visual Arts and they use artists that work with senior leaders that come in and do a a leadership program, but everything is done through the visual arts. And we did an exercise with an artist in residence, and it was amazing by doing something creative how much people really did tap into a different part of of themselves. So the first step, I think, is just, you know, for some people, they may really know what the idea is, in which case then they can begin to go down the path of really thinking through all the elements of how they actually want their business to be structured. What what is it that they want to do? What's the business model? Uh, Who is their market? You know, what's so what's the way that they can actually be selling their product and service? And then right. advice I give to everybody is always you want to be starting and testing and trying and getting out in the market well before you give your impassioned speech to your coworkers about how you're quitting and never coming back to your job. Because uh, having a great business plan or an idea is really not enough. You want to have the experience of actually doing it to see if it has a likelihood of being viable. You know, I saw Cheryl Richardson talking uh, at a coaching conference probably four or five years ago now. And, you know, coaches, the coaching profession is notorious for people quitting their day job, launching out, and then struggling to actually turn it into a, a viable business. Um, because it's a it's a profession that engages passion for a lot of people. It's a sense of really doing work that matters. Um, but Cheryl Richardson's key advice was: do not give up your day job. You know, you need to start developing this beforehand and building 
building a reservoirs of 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 financial and emotional and intellectual experience that you can use to get the experience you require so that when you do launch you're ready to you're ready to step out it's so true and it does break my heart whenever i see that because you know passion is really not enough the the metaphor that i I often use about it is the passion is really the fuel that will drive whatever vehicle it is that you're driving and 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 that is you know your particular business and your your business model but without that vehicle you just have this fuel which doesn't you know it can't move anything forward you have to have something that really is tested and a coaching business is just like any other business you have to really walk through and make sure that you have a market and that you know you know what your core message is and that you have a valuable product or a service exactly. and so it is um, the, the, the best way that I've seen people uh, find those things out is really by testing and trying things very frequently. It's not sitting back for eight months and doing a gigantic business plan that's bound at Kinko's. Yeah. It's having an idea and thinking about a, a particular focus where you do choose one particular slice of what you might want to do. So for software developers that might be creating a really small prototype of a product and getting it out there in front of real customers to see what the feedback is. Yep. For somebody that's in a service business like a consultant or a coach, it is actually doing a real thing like a small consulting engagement or maybe running a teleclass or doing a couple coaching sessions in order to see a if it really is as interesting as you think it's going to be yeah. because sometimes the idea is more exciting than actually doing it exactly <laughs> and and B you begin to see what the reaction is from your market and people might say well you know this is okay but it's really not quite what I was looking for or right. if you would offer it in this format then it might be more interesting right exactly. and that's a much better approach. You actually, you know, mitigate a lot more risk because you don't invest in things yep. uh, without knowing what the response is going to be, and you actually get it done much more quickly when you're dealing with feedback from your real market. Yeah, I mean, the only thing that I know about business plans is they're immediately out of date as soon as you start trying to implement them. And um, what you're saying is like you need to do some planning and some thinking about this, but actually. Uh, Direction and insight and focus will come from rapid iterations and prototyping and going, oh, this doesn't work, but this might work. That's true. That's what I, I worked with Tim Berry, who I'm not sure if you know him. He's the CEO of Palo Alto Software that makes business planning software. Really well-known blogger. He writes for Entrepreneur and just one of the nicest men on the planet, just a really good guy. And he really educated me about the whole business planning process. I, I uh, joked in my book, but it's a serious joke. My, my business plan was based on a Dr. Seuss book. Right. called If I Ran the Circus. It was an assignment that I did for a class at UC Berkeley. And it was basically, you know, create a vision of if you could just do anything you wanted, what would it be? And my, you know, my business plan was I'll live in San Francisco, which I did at the time. But, right. you know, I'll work out of my home and I'll travel and take a month off each year and make a lot of money and just, you know, just wild, did a wild brainstorm. And actually, that's exactly what happened pretty much from the first day I started working. But it wasn't due to having this extensive business plan. A lot of it was right skill set, right place, right time. Yeah, yeah. And what, what Tim is saying is it's not the business plan you need to focus on. It's the active business planning. Mm -hmm. If you make it a regular part of what you do in your business, it, it's very true. that. And he says business plans are always wrong, always. Yeah. But what it is is it gives you a marker and it gives you some metrics and measurements to, and, and where you're documenting your assumptions about what you think can happen. So as you go back the next month and look back and say, okay, what really happened? Here's what I thought was going to happen. Yeah. And here's what really did and why. And you can go back and have some specific places to look and say, oh, I see. You know, I actually didn't... Um, my marketing plan didn't go according to plan and I sent the, the letter out late and therefore it wasn't enough time. Or I see that the sales letter I used wasn't really effective or, you know, a whole range of other things. But business planning is something that an entrepreneur needs to do on a regular basis. That's how you really stay in touch with your business. And uh, you're right. It's, you know, like anything, we always, it, we can't predict the future. We can't predict how the business is going to go. But as entrepreneurs, we have really short memories and you can get really inspired by, by plans and have ideas and you kind of forget what you're assumptions were, what you were thinking, and then you can go down the road and say, ah, oh, you know, what many people do early on is say, what was I thinking? I just, 
I'm not cut out to be an entrepreneur, right. as opposed to being more like a scientist and saying, okay, that was really fascinating. I thought this was going to happen, right. and yet this happened, and so why is that? Let me really investigate it. And that's actually where you make much more progress, and you don't beat yourself up with these, to me, completely unhelpful notions of what it means to be successful or what it means to be a failure. That just, to me, is totally unhelpful if you're serious about really bringing a business into the world. Okay, so say a bit more about that, because... Um, that that stick or carrot and stick piece around this is what success looks like, this is what failure looks like, it, 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 that's not useful for entrepreneurs. It's not. It can be unhelpful for anybody in any situation. So just say a little bit more about what you mean by how those different uh, uh, goals can tangle you up. Well, it's normally what we say if uh, when you're undertaking a business venture is, you know, success for many people, the metric they often use is, is money, right? That you know, I was supposed to make this amount of money or sell this amount of product and, and, you know, it did or it didn't happen. And so somebody who is a, quote, successful entrepreneur is somebody who, you know, just has everything go according to plan and uh, where everything works out. That, that is so rarely happens. <laughs> Most of the entrepreneurs that I know, uh, you can never predict what's going to happen and the whole nature of, of creativity, and I think of life itself, is that you it, it, it doesn't fall in a neat, organized plan, especially when you're dealing with a rapidly changing market. Right. And if you're selling to human beings, to, you know, complex human beings that have all the kinds of different reasons for, you know, for buying and selling. Right. So the, the, when you just get stuck in saying, you know, I, I will be a successful business person only if things go according to plan, I, I basically think you're just kind of going against the way the market works and the way nature works. The, 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 what I call successful entrepreneurs, people who are, you know, thriving and happy, enjoying what they're doing and also making money, are those that just constantly are checking in and evaluating, well, what happened? Like, I tried to do this. It didn't work. Why is that? What can I tweak? What support can I get? Who can help me? How can I fix it? And then they fix it, and then they, you know, keep moving on and keep trying new things. Right. So that, that, that to me is really how I view it. And I just see people getting really caught in that um, view, which ends up then having them have certain feelings about themselves of saying, I am a failure, as opposed to I had different business results than were in my plan. I mean, th those are just two different things. When you feel like a failure and you have that thought in your head, then you tend to be really not motivated and, and go slinking back to, you know, whatever form of employment people will have you at, which is just not, not a position of strength. That's a great insight. And I love the separation of the personal and the professional from I am a failure to I got different results than I was expecting. But this isn't necessarily a personal judgment about whether I have any value in this world or not. It's not, and we just put so we put everything off in, in that in that same bucket, you know. That yes, it, and, and I see this so much today with people who are being laid off, where they're just have this huge identity shift. You know, they felt good, they felt secure in the world because they had a different role as somebody who is a you know well employed, successful employee, or even an entrepreneur that had a really successful business who then has been impacted by the wild market shifts that we've all experienced. And when you you know, it really is their circumstances. There's circumstances about your job going away. There's circumstances about the market. But it really doesn't have anything to do with who you are as a human being on planet Earth. It really doesn't. And when you can begin to see that and just look at all of it as learning, you know, of how can I use this challenge to really learn? You know, how can this make me a better human being? How can I really use this experience to get to know truly what it is that I'm made of? Yeah. That, again, some of it is in the lore and the mythology of entrepreneurs where you always hear, you know, every good entrepreneur has to be a wildly, you know, wild, wildly huge failure. <laughs> right. But but in some ways I, I some ways I can really see that because when you've experienced the depths of failure, you have a couple choices. You can just curl up in the fetal position and hope that a you know sugar daddy or sugar mama will rescue you and take yeah. care of you, or you can say, "Who am I really? What am I made of?" and uh, I, you know, how can I really change this situation around and make something good from this really tortured situation? And when you find that strength, it will inform everything about who you are and what you do. And you will have a much more compelling story for your business. And that's that root of passion that you'll feel from somebody who's not just saying, yeah, I've just been, you know, spoon fed whipped cream my entire life and everything is good. But, but like, I get what it is. I get what it means to really be on, on my knees with, with failure or with, uh, you know, financial ruin. And yet I have not let it affect me as a human being. And I think people feel that, and I know entrepreneurs feel that, of, of really feeling their passion. So 
There's about one million different ways we could go with this interview and no time to do it. So I'm going to ask you one more question. Um, and it's about what you're pointing to, I think, is some insights and tactics around how, as an entrepreneur, can you build your resilience to the, the, the slings and arrows of, of that life. And um, you know, part of it is around this understand your role in your success and failure and understand that actually it's your business being measured rather than yourself. But if you were to offer one other insight or perhaps tactic around how as an entrepreneur do you build your resilience to the, to the, the ebb and the flow of that life, what, what might you offer? Other people. Yay, great answer. <laughs> Uh, if you try to do it on your own, no matter what a great self-motivated person that you are and, and, you know, what a spiritual view you have on life and everything, there are times where you just really feel awful mm -hmm. and you need somebody who uh, it really loves you and supports you. So there's a, having a, a strong support base in terms of family and friends, the people who really will just pick you up and say it's going to be okay. <laughs> And you also need to have people around you who have been in that same situation as a business owner, in this case particularly, where they can say, you know, I really empathize with how you're feeling, and here is how I actually got through it and, and got out of it. And that is, it's such a powerful feeling to just feel the support coming from others, but also to realize, again, it's a circumstance. It's a particular thing that happened. It doesn't mean that your life is over or your, your business is over. Um, and I have a kind of a funny example of that I did you know amongst many you know many mistakes that I've made in my business or just you know little things that happen I had written this long post on pricing once and which I spent a lot of time on and and I was researching a piece of it for uh, getting some input from Alan Weiss who is the million dollar yeah. consultant as he's known at brand wise really you know smart guy very well known about pricing has very strong opinions and he had done an interview with Robert Middleton who's a great small business marketing guy yeah. actually yeah. marketing and so I listened to the interview which had great information in it but it was listening to the dialogue from Alan and he just is a real straight shooter and he said some things which I was just censoring for my own audience and I thought hmm, I'm not sure all of my people are going to totally agree with what he's saying. So as I was trying to finish this post on deadline because my babysitter was about to expire, right, any parents understand that one, I wrote, um, you know, there's this great interview, which, and I put the link to it, you know, with, with Robert and Alan, but sometimes he comes across a little bit crass. And I used that word thinking that it was, you know, had a little bit of an edge, a little bit direct. Yeah. Well, the next morning I got this scathing email from Alan Weiss, who of course I had never met before, who <laughs> said, you know, I don't know who you are, how dare you call me crass. Us, to which case I ran to my dictionary and found out it just is a complete insult. Like you have no education, you're yeah, really it's rude. <laughs> and, yeah, it's pretty harsh. And it was one of those things where I just it was just a poorly chosen word because I, I really had one definition in my mind and right. and the other one came out. So of course I was mortified and and I wrote right back to him and apologized and I wrote an apology post and ended up actually doing a piece about how you recover from mistakes that became a really uh, successful uh, blog post and, and actually made it into my book because I, I really try to to uh, learn from my own mistakes and share it with others. And yeah. I got a comment on that post from one of my dear blog readers in the UK who was so funny who said that he was sharing like the, the, the misuse of a word and he said that one of his friends had gone to interview at a prior company where he worked and his boss at the time kept telling her how it was a great place to work because they had a very low rate of nutrition. <laughs> and he said, <laughs> the, the, his, his friend came back and she said, I'm so sorry. It looks like a great place to work, but I just simply can't because every time I think about him, I'm going to think about the low rate of nutrition, which he meant to say attrition. Of course. People stayed at the company for a long time. Right. And uh, he's very funny. And he said, you know, actually, we all really were quite skinny at the time. <laughs> you know, but like he, sh he shared this and he shared this example of somebody using the wrong word, you know, to, to, to great effect with me in the comments. And it just completely changed everything about how I was feeling you know I just felt embarrassed and oh it just felt so bad because it was such a public you know thing that happened it was somebody you know that was high profile and I'm, I'm not a, a controversial person I don't like to attack you know for purpose of polarization that's just not my style so it was just so wonderful to get that and it just completely changed my mood and it reminded me once again that we all need each other and the the, the journey for whatever it is that we're, we're doing um, is always going to be a bumpy one. And so when you have people like that around you to make you laugh and to support you and, and, and bring, you, bring you through, that to me is, is the secret sauce, which allows people to keep moving forward. You know, I, I say that in my life I'm looking for people who make me think and make me laugh because if I've got those two things, the rest is gravy.
and uh, I think you're speaking to something very similar around who are the people around you to, to, to support you and guide you and hold your hand and give you a hug and, and cheer you on and kick you up the bum when that's required. So that's a, that's a great final tip. Pam, it's so good talking to you. I know people are going to want to follow up and find out more about you and your work. How do they find you? Best place to find me is at escapefromcubiclenation.com. And I have uh, four years worth of blog posts, and there's also the first chapter of my book, which you can download for free. And that has all the information about the book there. So, And the book, of course, is available at uh, any respectable and probably some unrespectable book sellers yeah. near you. Hopefully some unrespectable yeah, ones. Exactly. Oh, not just respectable. <laughs> so, Pam, thank you so much. It's been great talking to you. Likewise. Thanks for having me. We hope you enjoyed this Best of MBS interview. Want more great content? Head to mbs.works. There you'll find MBS's new podcast, Two Pages. You can learn about his best-selling books, and you can join the newsletter. That's mbs.works.